Daniel 11, verse 23, please. Recall where we are within our context. Uh, we are walking through the verses from Daniel 11, 21 through verse 35 uh, that deal directly with who we would understand from history to be Antiochus IV Epiphanes. We see him rise to the scene around 175 B.C. It would only be some 10 years later that his reign would come to a head as it relates to his dealings with the nation of Israel. He is a flatterer, uh, just as we would recognize the man of sin and the son of perdition to be. He is a man uh, who is um, able to get his way uh, to deceive others, to uh, place himself in a, uh, a functionally good position by virtue of uh, his flatteries. And uh, in doing so, we see a definitive change come over the nation of Israel as um, the certain within the contingency of Israel's people, of Israel's leaders, of Israel's priesthood, are seeking to Hellenize the, the, the country, right? Are seeking to make Israel become Greek. And in doing so, um, are looking to erode traditions, erode doctrines, and we also uh, find in that time that there's a shame that has come over the people of Israel as it relates to their Jewish distinctives. They start to hide their circumcision. Uh, they, um, they do not speak openly of the things of the Lord and of, of the, the law of Moses and these things. In uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 23, we read this. After the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. We see this idea of a league, and in 170 BC, we, we find that Antiochus IV actually rescinds the league that was made by his father and Ptolemy through marriage with Cleopatra. Now remember, Antiochus did not have a right to the throne, but he was uh, within that general lineage. The ones that had the right to the throne um, um, were either assassinated or were arrested and in Rome at this time. And we find this idea of there being a league. Now, as soon as you see that, especially since we know where we're headed here as a transition to Antichrist, uh, you should begin to start to see a little bit of a trend um, that we have this league made and uh, we see Antiochus rescinding this league, this, this agreement that was made. And we might think immediately toward the rescinding of the covenant that's made between um, Daniel's people, Israel, and, and the prince uh, that shall come. So we see that in chapter 11, verse 23. Uh, the treaty spoken is likely, as I mentioned, the one brokered by the marriage of Ptolemy and Cleopatra, Antiochus's sister, who is still active as the queen mother in Egypt. Uh, he circumvents his nephew, Ptolemy Philometer, by treachery and begins to move against the nation here. So um, he begins to move against the nation uh, of Egypt. And of course, as we see here, it says that he shall become strong with a small people. Uh, we might recognize that to be his influence in Israel, th that they are a small people, and yet his influence is growing. We also then read in verses 24 through 27, there's going to be several instances, several historical instances here. We read this. He shall enter peaceably even unto the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them a prey, a spoil, and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time, and he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain, and both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So we begin here. Um, Philometer realizes that Antiochus' treachery takes 
uh, he realizes his treachery and he takes a huge force to fight. So um, now Egypt recognizes that Antiochus has been flattering, um, that he's broken this treaty um, that was made between his father and um, uh, Egypt through Cleopatra and he gets together this very large force. He fails, however, due to treachery by his trusted counselors, uh, those who eat his meat. That's the idea here, that those who eat his meat, um, uh, um, ch -ch 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 um, where are we? Uh, verse 26, yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So his own uh, counselors, his trusted counselors, uh, effectively turn against him and he ends up being captured and the kings thus in this captured state uh, begin kind of a, a game of mutual deceit. So they're sitting at the same table and though the king has been captured, remember Antiochus is a flatterer, right? So he doesn't just have him destroyed or anything of the sort. That's not his style. His style is to find a back door, find a way to flatter the king and to make it seem as though uh, there's a win-win here or to get what he wants through flattery. So they, they sit down at a table and they begin to talk back and forth and it's a game of mutual deceit. They're both lying to one another. Uh, they're, they're pretending uh, how they're going to partner with one another and how this is going to work out just fine. Um, they're speaking kind to one another, but they're both lying. They're both just completely lying one to another. It's just a game of, of diplomatic back and forth. Neither one is actually successful um, at getting what they want. And uh, Antiochus would eventually fail to take Egypt, even though he was very successful in this particular battle. And so there's kind of a stalemate. Well, during this same time in 170, the Jews heard a rumor that within this battle, Antiochus was killed. And on the basis of this rumor, they throw a monster celebration. Uh, they, they, are, they are rejoicing in the streets because Antiochus is dead, and they don't like Antiochus, though he was gaining influence in the land. And um, he didn't die. And so on the return journey, um, he is very angry at Jerusalem for this, and he takes time to spoil Jerusalem. On top of this, however, he, um, he kills many of the people as well. And then you see there on that last little bit, Antiochus ultimately fails to take Egypt. He returns home with great wealth but wounded pride. So he, he has great wealth. He won the battle, but he didn't have the means by which to finish the job. He's coming back. He hears of all of these things happening in, uh, in Jerusalem. He ends up uh, spoiling Jerusalem. He kills many of them at this time because he's angry at them for this thing. Um, and he, he goes home and the job is not done yet and he's very upset. So um, he takes Memphis, he installs this man, the man that he conquered, Philometer, as a vassal king. He becomes a joint ruler with his brother. He marries uh, their sister Cle Cleopatra. Uh, Antiochus has a measure of control, but he was not able to take all of Egypt. The Jews hear this rumor um, and they celebrate. Um, and then Antiochus is, you know, very grumpy because of that. He's grumpy because his plans in Egypt fail. He's not a happy guy. We read about this in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 9, uh, 29 to 32. Now remember, as far as Maccabees is concerned, Maccabees are books written around that time. The Maccabee family we've not been introduced yet to yet, but they are, are going to become the freedom fighters and in some ways the very foundation of the Pharisees in the land, um, and the Zealots as well, as we see the Zealots in the New Testament. And so the Maccabees are, are uh, uh, who they are, and they wrote these, these uh, nationalistic histories of the accounts of this time. So they say here in 1 Maccabees, after two years fully expired, the king sent his chief collector of tribute unto the cities of Judah, who came unto Jerusalem with a great multitude, and spake peaceable words unto them, but all was deceit. For when they had given him credence, he fell suddenly upon the city, and smote it very sore, and destroyed much people of Israel. And when he had taken the spoils of the city, he set it on fire, and pulled down the houses and the walls thereof on every side. But the women and children took they captive and possessed the cattle. So this was Antiochus's response to them celebrating. He, he came in deceitfully. He ended up um, destroying many of the people, taking the spoil, setting the city on fire, pulling down the houses, doing this great destruction, and they had no capacity to do anything about it. 
And that leads us, uh, well, um, before we do that, um, any questions? So as verse 28 says, he returns to his land with great riches. His heart is against the Holy Covenant. That would be Israel. And he does exploits, and then he returns to his own land. Okay, and this leads us to 168 B.C., verses 29 and then the first half of 30. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter, for the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So in 168 B.C., Antiochus IV, he heads back down to Egypt for a third campaign. He is determined this time to finish the job to take Egypt. However, as he's on his way down, he meets a man, an emissary of Rome. This is a, a very uh, common, oft-told uh, part of history. This is where the, the phrase to draw a line in the sand comes from. Uh, tradition, history, something in between tells us that he met this emissary, Papilius Lanus, and on the way down, his, the emissary is there representing Rome, and Antiochus comes out to meet him, and the emissary draws a line. Some say a line, some say uh, a line and then a circle around the two of them. So he draws a circle around the two of them, and he draws a line in the sand. And he says, if you cross this line, heading south toward Egypt, if you cross this line, you've just declared war on Rome. Or you can turn back the other way. You will give me an answer before you leave this circle. And that was effectively the ultimatum. You don't have a chance to think about this. You don't get to go back and, and talk to your counselors. When you leave this circle, you either leave it by crossing this line and declaring war on Rome, or you leave it by turning around and going home. Antiochus had absolutely no means by which to fight Rome and Egypt at this time. So uh, Antiochus, he returns. The sh ships of Chittim, or Chittim, uh, th they're, they're Cyprians, and they inhabited the Northeast Mediterranean, so we would regard that to be Rome. Rome had the Northeast Mediterranean under their control at this time, so the ships that came from that direction, the Cyprians, Cyprus, um, this would be most likely Rome. History tells us that this happened, so we are putting those pieces together. Uh, they, uh, Roman, it should be Rome there, expressly forbade Syria from attacking with the consequence of refusal being war. And so Antiochus turns home very, very angry at this. And he decides to take this anger out on the Jews, whether that was just a, a convenient source or whether he thought, I need, to, I need to establish my dominance in the Middle East a little bit stronger, in that land of Palestine a little stronger, because now I've got Rome over here and they're not letting me fight Egypt anymore. And Egypt, of course, can now strengthen themselves. Uh, we don't necessarily know. But that leads us to the 15th of the month of Kislu in 168 BC. This would be what, what we would consider to be December, 168 BC. And we read this uh, second half of verse 30. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So Antiochus, being very angry at this embarrassment, stops by Jerusalem on his way to Syria, and he orders his general, a man named Apollonius, Apoll Apollonius, to occupy Jerusalem and to stamp out every last trace of Judaism. This is where Antiochus made a huge mistake. As we've said, 
it's quite possible that had he waited another decade or two, 50 years at the most, Judaism would have been, and if things had continued as they had, Judaism would have been stamped out. But he made the mistake of stirring up the nationalism by attempting to take the people farther, by, 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 by stopping the little baby steps toward compromise and toward apostasy and trying to turn up the heat all the way. And immediately the people realized what was happening, right? And they said, no, this, this is not going to happen. We, we're, we're not going to have all of this stripped from us. So he demands that Israel becomes Greek. The temple function ceased entirely. He even went so far as to sacrifice pigs upon the altar. Now we know that pigs were unclean, right? Which means that by sacrificing a pig upon the altar, he has now desecrated the altar. It is no longer functional for its purpose. You can't just sacrifice, just to start up your sacrifices a day after a pig has been put on the altar. You have to completely ceremonially cleanse the entire temple now if, if you're to do any more sacrifices. So he, 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 he basically blasphemes everything the Jews believe or everything they had characteristically, nationalistically, historically believed. He erects a statue of Zeus in the, in the Holy of Holies, basically proclaiming this is now your God. That's what we would consider to be the abomination of desolation. That's what the Maccabees would call the abomination of desolation. And then, uh, um, oh, excuse me, in, 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 not, not in place of the Holy of Holies, in place of the brazen altar um, there. And this divides lines very sharply in Israel. See, there were many in Israel that were trying to get this, right? They wanted this. This, is, this was their goal. This is what they were hoping for. This is what they've been very slowly but surely working towards. These are like, you know, those people in politics who their goal is to bring the society to this, but they're going to do baby steps, right, to get you there. Because they're never, you're never going to be able to get Medicare for all in one vote, so you vote in Obamacare, right? And then when Obamacare fails, you vote in patchwork for Obamacare. And then when that fails, you vote in more patchwork. And then at the end of the day, you just say that none of this is working, just give us Medicare for all. And that's how you go from having one system to having another system. And of course, it started well before Obamacare, right? But that's the idea. The, the idea is that you do baby step, baby step, baby step, baby step, baby step. And with each baby step, a person says, well, I don't like that, but I, it's a little bit of compromise, fine, right? We'll just compromise a little bit. And then the Overton window changes, meaning what's acceptable in society, now it's shifted. And then, and then in a few years, they say, we got to compromise again. And then there's a shift, and there's shift, and a shift, and a shift, and a shift, and a shift. And next thing you know, you're all the way over here, and you got there through a lot of very small compromises of your principles over time, right? And that's, that's how these things work. So that's what they had been trying to do. That's what the priests had been trying to do. The, the, these Hellenistic priests, right, the priests that were friendly to, to Syria, had been trying to do. And, and when, when Antiochus comes in and he does this, he says, we're just changing. Everything's changing, and I'm, I'm imposing this top down. And he had the ability to do that because he had the army. Israel has no army. He has the power. Israel has no power. They have no means by which to fight back against this, per, per se. And so he erects the statue of Zeus. Uh, he sacrifices a pig on the, on the altar. And lines divide very sharply. Those who had already rejected Jehovah were carried away by these flatteries. They say, okay, it's time. It's time for this to happen. Uh, it, this isn't easy, but it's time. Uh, many others said no. And it, it caused a bounce back effect. It caused a violent reaction against this idea to where maybe before they'd been kind of on the fence, who knows, whatever, you know, there are these traditions and I kind of love them and, and they're in our, and this is our history and this is our God, but you know, and now they're, they're saying, no, we're, we're in, we're in a hundred percent. And uh, this is always what martyrdom does, right? It causes you to have to choose sides. You can't sit on the fence when somebody is threatening your life and you have to make a choice. You're either in or you're out, right? Uh, so this brings about, uh, well, we're not, we'll, we'll, we'll read from Maccabees first. So Antiochus proposes to Hellenize the Jews, and he purposes to do so once for all. We read about this in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 41 to 64. It'll be a bit of a chunk here. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. He's sick of this allowing for different people to have different ideas thing. 
and everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah that they should follow the strange laws of the land and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple and that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days and pollute the sanctuary and the holy people, set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts, that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation." To the end, they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said he should die. In the selfsame manner wrote he to his whole kingdom and appointed overseers over all the people, commanding the cities of Judah to sacrifice city by city. Then many of the people were gathered unto them to wit every one that forsook the law. And so they committed evils in the land and drove the Israelites into secret places, even with, wheresoever they could flee for succor or relief. Now the fifteenth day of the month, Kislu or Kislu, in the hundred and forty and fifth year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar and builded idol altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side and burnt incense at the doors of their houses and in the streets." And when they had rent in pieces the books of the law which they found. So literally they're tearing the law of Moses, right? They're tearing them up. They're throwing them in the fire. They're, they're, they're apostatizing entirely. They burnt them with fire. And whosoever was found with any book of the Testament or any committed to the law, the king's commandment was that they should put him to death. Thus did they by their authority unto the Israelites every month to as many as were found in the cities. Now, the five and twenty... 20th day of the month, they did sacrifice upon the altar, which was upon the altar of God, at which time, according to the commandment, they put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised, and they hanged the infants about their necks and rifled their houses and slew them that had circumcised them, howbeit many in Israel were fully resolved and confirmed in themselves not to eat any unclean thing, wherefore the rather to die that they might not be defiled with meats and that they might not profane the Holy Covenant. So then they died. And there was very great wrath upon Israel. So this is uh, the general historical account in the Maccabees about what, what happened here. So mothers are being killed because they are choosing to circumcise their children. The children are, are being killed. Um, the, the people, anyone who, who tries to observe the Sabbath, anyone who follows the laws of God, who is even found having the law of God in their possession, would be killed. Um, it was a, a time of tremendous suffering for the people of Israel. It was a time of, of tremendous difficulty. And yet, through it, grew a national fervor and a determination that they were not going to let this happen. And we know that this would be of the Lord um, to preserve His Word and to preserve His people this was an attempt, as we've seen throughout history in any number of times, by Satan to bring about the end of God's people. And um, by, in one sense, God's grace, Antiochus did not have the patience to see through the slow, steady compromise over time. And so, instead, tried to drop the hammer and in doing so, um, brought about national fervor. And now there's dividing lines. And now people know who the enemy is. They've come out. And now people know what's going on. Thoughts on this? Sarah. Is this the time they started hiding the kids, the dead souls? Is this when they were hiding the scriptures? They, well, they, yes, they most certainly were hiding scriptures. Whether or not, there are some that speculate that this is, that, that the, the caves in Qumran um, were caves that were there, hidden, from the times of the Maccabees. They were hiding scriptures at this time, yes. Um, the extent to which that inter, inter relates with, say, the Qumran scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, is not 100% known. Other thoughts or questions? Was the Ark of the Covenant still... 
the last mention of the Ark of the Covenant that we have is well before this point. Um, um, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was. I preached on that when we were in Jeremiah. Um, I'm trying to remember when the exact last mention of the Ark is. What we did mention is that there are many people that speculate that the Ark was hidden before Babylon came in. And the reason why is because in Jeremiah, in the last pages of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is fairly thorough in his explanation of what happened to the temple. He talks about all of the, the cups and the platters being taken away and the, the pillars being taken down and, the, and the, the brass and the gold being taken off of them. And yet he doesn't mention the Ark of the Covenant. And that makes a lot of people really curious. And that's where Jeremiah's grotto theories come in and the fact that he hit it, that Jeremiah hit it, and some believe that he went down to where Elijah, that he took it down to where Eli the cave that Elijah um, ran to and the cave that Moses was in when he asked the Lord to show him his glory, and that's the same one that Elijah rent, went to after Mount Carmel. And some believe that he hit it there. Um, some believe that he hit it in Jerusalem. And um, there's a, uh, within our circles, again, um, there's an there's a archaeologist, um, uh, an amateur archaeologist named Ron Wyatt. And Ron Wyatt has done a lot of good work as it relates to the Exodus. And then he started doing other work as it relates to Noah's Ark and the Ark of the Covenant. And before he died, he gave testimony that he actually got to see the Ark of the Covenant, that he crawled into a cave that was underneath Jerusalem, and, and that there he met an angel and, uh, that was guarding it, and he took video of the whole thing. And then um, he decided not to share that video. Uh, and... Um, lots of kind of, it gets a little bit weird and kooky and, and whatnot um, and such. And, and yet he and his followers still, you know, pretty strongly believe that the Ark is there. Um, this goes right in, in line with a, a theory that's floating around now in the mystic elements of, you know, the, of Christianity, the ones that kind of like, like the mystic part. Um, that the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, is underground and it was below Mount Calvary so that when Jesus bled and, and when the, the earth shook, it actually created a fissure in the ground through which the blood went and poured onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and they're looking, you know, and, and yet none of this, I mean, none of it's biblical, right? None of it is provable. Um, none of it has been revealed to us and none of it is necessary. I, true, false, I, I'm, I, you know, whatever. I don't know. Um, but none of it, and, and, and not, not, none of it has any, any basis in Scripture. Um, Jesus' blood did not have to sprinkle the mercy seat of the physical Ark of the Covenant. We do know that the Ark, in one way, shape, or form, is seen in the heavenly temple. In, uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in Revelation, we see this idea of it being there. So whatever that means, whether that's symbolic, whether that's... Um, whether it's, 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 it's some physical thing or whether... Uh, you know, Jesus obviously was the fulfillment of the ark, right? Jesus is the fulfillment of the ark. So uh, whether it's symbolic speaking toward the idea of Christ in the temple or whether it's something physical, that's a lot of things that we'll know one day and we don't, we don't quite know yet. But there's a lot of speculation out there as to these things. Um, um, yeah, so I, uh, on, on that... I, I do like Ron Wyatt's scholarship on the Exodus, if you've ever looked up anything and you've come across his name. Um, I'm comfortable with his scholarship on the Ark, or not the, not, not the Ark of the Covenant, but, the, but Noah's Ark. I, uh, I'm completely baffled at his testimony as it relates to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, it, with each one, it gets more mystical. So with, with the... With the Exodus stuff, like he actually followed, he, he actually did like archaeology and research and whatnot. And then with the Ark, Noah's Ark, they traveled in a taxi until the Lord told them to stop and then they went out and they found it, um, which you know, gets a little more mystical and a little less factual. And then with the Ark of the Covenant, it just you know, kind of goes off the rails and everything is deeply spiritual and no, not provable in any way, shape, or form, except for that tape that he said he has, but he never showed anyone. So, um, because he felt as though it wasn't the right time to reveal it. So, anyway, all of that to say that, that uh, I agree with him on the stuff that he proves. I'm very skeptical of the stuff that he just throws out there and wants us to believe. 
Uh, other, f other final thoughts or questions? So at this time, no, the ark was not here at this time, for sure. Um, at this point, they, they had uh, not seen the ark for quite a while, we would presume. Okay. Um, so this begins what we would call the Maccabean Revolt. And I read you verses 31 through 35, and we do see that here. So um, uh, verse 32, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. So there are people that Antiochus corrupts, those that don't have any interest in the things of the Lord, in the things uh, of God. And then the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits, right? So that, now we're talking about there's a contention here. And that's what we often call um, the Maccabean re Revolt. It's led by a man named Mattathias Macca Maccabeus, or the Maccabeans, right? And his five sons. They would, over the course of many years, drive Syria from the land of Israel. And eventually, they would purify the temple. And they would do so on the 25th of Kislu, almost three years to the day after it was defiled. So it was defiled on the 15th of Kislu. On the 25th of Kislu, three years later, 165 BC, um, they would purify the temple and it would reinitiate, they would reinitiate the system, the sacrificial system. And um, this is the feast, and then from this was initiated a feast and a celebration called Hanukkah. And Hanukkah, is a commemoration or the Feast of Light, so the Feast of the Dedication. This was a time when, and the menorah uh, was intended to signify that when they sought to rededicate the temple, they only had a very little bit of oil left. And so they put the oil in the lampstand, and that oil did not go out for the number of days of the purification and the dedica dedication of the feast. And so they are commemorating this divine intervention whereby God allowed the oil in the menorah to continue uh, supernaturally throughout the course of the purification and the, de de and, and the, the dedication process and um, bring them to the end of that feast. Though they did not have enough oil to actually do it, they by faith stepped out and did it. And that's the tradition surrounding Hanukkah and this feast uh, to commemorate when the temple was re established. To that end of any feast, now the Feast of Purim, which commemorates the days of Esther, also called the Feast of Lots, and then this feast, Hanukkah, also called the Feast of the Dedication, or the Feast of L Festival of Lights, or the Feast of Lights, those are not prescribed in the, in the Old Testament, right? Ironically, those are the two that we probably know about the most in Jewish, as far as Jewish holidays, and they're the least important to the Jews. The most important day is the Day of Atonement still. Passover is really, really important to them. Uh, uh, Pentecost is important. Tabernacles, because those are the ones that are in the Old Testament. But they do regard these. Hanukkah is a nationalistic feast. Hanukkah is, 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 is a feast that celebrates Israel overthrowing their oppressors. Hanukkah is a feast that lives in the minds of, of the Jews saying, one day we will be free. One day we will have a king and he will put down all the nations that hate us. So Hanukkah is, though not the most important feast, it is perhaps the most nationalistic time of the year for the Jews. It's a time where their mind is on the overthrow of their oppressors because that's what Hanukkah represents. It represents the day that they overcame Syria. And, 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 and we'll, we'll, we'll get into the nitty-gritty of this a little bit more with the Maccabees, but make no mistake, this was an entire army against guerrilla warfare freedom fighters in Israel that were simply convinced that God was on their side. And they were able to drive back that entire army. And so it really is a very significant thing. And the Bible tells us it would happen. That, that the, the people of God, that they would know their God, that they would do exploits. And, um, and that many would die. Many would fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity. When they got captured, they were traitors. They were, they were killed for this. Any of these freedom fighters, any of these zealots, but they would be helped. They would be helping with a little help. And this would be, as verse 35 says, to purify them. And then we see in 164 BC, just a year after Syria is pushed back out of Israel, Antiochus IV dies. 
So um, to, to summarize here, the Samaritans, seeing this desolation, denied all association with the Jews, and they disassociated their temple worship with Jehovah. So at this point, we have the Samaritans, having seen all of this that happened, completely disassociate. The Samaritans were under the thumb of Syria too, and they went hook, line, and sinker. They said, okay, Antiochus, you win. We're, we're, you know, they, they gave in. They were not a part of the resistance. They were not a part of the freedom fighters. They were not a part of the zealots. They disassociated their temple worship with Jehovah, and Antiochus commands them to adopt G Greek customs. They did so. They were left in peace. So now, the, the, wh wh whatever it might, may have been where the Jews saw some connection to the Samaritans, at this point, you have the Jews seeing the Samaritans with the same eye that they're seeing their own people who are going after Syria, right? So the Samaritans are just as, as, uh, as culpable or as guilty as anyone else of, of apostatizing in full. Even if the Samaritans had before given lip service, now these zealous Jews, they're not interested in that lip service any longer. And that is where we leave the history here. As we continue in, in Daniel 11, and this is where we're going we're gonna to leave off, it's in verse 36 that we begin to see a transition to Antiochus. The Bible says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and he shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. At this point, that's still fine. Antiochus Epiphanes, we're seeing that, that's fine. He, he regarded no god. Uh, he was against the god of gods. He, he did according to his own will. He exalted himself. I mean, his name was Epiphanes, right? Uh, which means great one or blessed one or, or, or enlightened one is what it is. Excuse me. Um, and then verse 37. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. And this is not quite as clearly Antiochus Epiphanes at this point. He did regard other gods. He did regard the God of his fathers. He did regard Zeus. Now, notice here, neither shall you regard the capital G in our Bibles in verse 37. The capital G, uh, you notice in verse 36 it says, um, speak marvelous things against the God, capital G, of God's lowercase g. And um, then uh, further on that verse, nor regard any God. So uh, the question as to what exactly the King James translators meant by making that a capital G, did they mean simply because it's, it's a, a singular God, a specific God, the God of his fathers? Some also interpret into this the idea that he, he, he speaking here, the God of his fathers being Jehovah, at which point that would mean that he is a Jew, and many people do believe that the Antichrist will be a Jew, and this is one of the verses that they use to speak to that. I do not believe that to be the case. The reason why I do not believe that to be the case is because when we look at um, Daniel chapter 9 and we see the abomination of desolation and all of these things, um, the Bible says in Daniel 9 in regard to the end of the 69th week, um, it says, in verse 26 of Daniel 9, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, right? So three score and two weeks is 62 weeks. We add that to uh, a previous seven weeks that has been spoken of, and that gives us 69 weeks. At the end of that 69 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. If we interpret 70 AD, when the sanctuary and the city were destroyed, into that verse, then the people of the prince that shall come is Rome, right? And so that being said, Antichrist, we would believe, I would believe, is coming out of that Roman Western world. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he's not a Jew by some sort of lineage, but it does mean that he is not associating himself with Israel. He is associating himself not with the Jewish people, but with what I would interpret to be the Western world empire. So he's not coming out of Israel. And again, this would, this would mesh properly with what we see of Antiochus, right? Antiochus was not a Jew. He came from outside in. 
And as, as we would understand Antiochus to be a type of Christ, or of, of Antichrist, we combine that with these and it gives a lot of anecdotal evidence that he probably will not be of Israel. He's not going to come out of Israel, I don't believe. And this is why. Because the prince that shall come, the people of the prince that shall come are the ones that destroyed the temple. So he will come out of Rome. Some will say a revived Roman Empire. I would simply say that Rome is indicative of the Western world and that the Western world empire, whatever it looks like in the day that Antichrist comes, he'll be the head of that. And he'll, he'll be kind of from the outside looking in, into Rome or into Israel in the same way that Antiochus did. That being said, I do believe that the false prophet will be an Israeli. I believe that he will be from Israel and that that will bring an effect um, whereby in order to convince the people of Israel, the false prophet uh, who, give, who honors the beast will be a Jew, I believe. And we also see as we get into Revelation that the beast is seen as coming from the sea and the false prophet is seen as coming from the land. And I remember when we interpreted those, I interpret the sea to be the Gentile world, the land to be Israel. And so that's also kind of undergirds my thinking on that. Chuck. Yes, as their 12th imam. Yes. Well, the, I'd say more Antichrist than the false prophet. I think it's actually Antichrist himself. That's. I, I, uh, from for my studies, the way I've understood the, the, the Quran and the book that I've resourced on that, um, the 12th Imam, I believe, better suits a picture of Antichrist himself than the false prophet, personally. Um, but the Quran? Yeah, they call him a prophet. I'm sorry? I'd have to dig deep. I, I, I'd, I'd have to dig deeper to know, to, to be able to speak toward any more of that. No, no, it's fine. Um, uh, um, it, you know, uh, there's a lot of possibilities, right? As to nationality and such. Um, but I do believe, based upon just the scriptures and not not the Quran or um, any of the other, because we, the Quran clearly speaks to Antichrist as their leader, as well as the Kabbalah, the Jewish writings. Um, the, many of the one, the, 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 that the leader that the Orthodox Jews are looking for fits Antichrist to a T. Um, so Orthodox Judaism, Islam, and then the uh, alien phenomenon. Many of the people who have been abducted by aliens and aliens, so-called, and have uh, been, been uh, and, and I would believe them to be a spiritual demonic interaction. It's not aliens, it's a demonic Abuse. It's a it's it's a demonic interaction. Those that have had these things and and it, there's too many similar accounts to just write it off as a bunch of crazies. There's too many people who have seen the same thing and who have who have experienced the same thing, and who have physical manifestations of it. But it could definitely be demonic, and I believe it is. And if it is demonic, um, they have also spoken to this idea of this uh, of a world leader who would come and unite the world and that unbelievers would be purged uh, from this world leader. And so there is a merging of, of doctrines in various religious systems. How that will play out, what that will look like, who that will be in total, I don't know. Like I said, it's not necessarily unfounded to say that the guy who will be Antichrist would claim to be a Jew or claim to be from Islam 
Um, but he, would, he will be leading the Western world. He will not be a guy who trickles up from Israel and, and claims to be you know, Israel's leader and then uh, from Israel strikes this peace accord. It will be the other guy that will, strike, that, that will make a covenant with Israel, right? It's not going to be the guy in Israel that will be Antichrist. I believe the guy in Israel could be the false prophet. Um, but the guy that makes this covenant with Israel, he'll be from outside Israel, regardless of his lineage. Um, and I believe he'll be the head of the Western world at that time. Sarah? Yes. Um, um, give me just a moment. Was there another question on, on this? Okay, um, now you're going to make me have to look things up. Um, no, it's fine. Um, give me just a moment here. Oh, no. I'll have to do it on my phone. I don't. I was fiddling with my computer the other day. Never fiddle with the computer you use at church. Let it live on forever as it is, um, which is impossible for me if anyone knows me. I can't do that. Um, cannot help but fiddle. Um, let me see, 20. Just see if I can find this real quick. Um, There is a prophecy, um, and it, it, it well, it, it, is, it is not directly a prophecy. Let me correct that. Um, but it is a uncanny connection. Um, and I wish, I think I might even have my notes on this in a different Bible, but let me double check here. John 10. Haggai 2.18. Let's see what that says. So in Haggai 2.18, um, Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Um, so, the, the, um, in Haggai, it, it shows that on the, on the, the 24th day of the ninth month um, was the day that the foundation of the temple, this restored temple from uh, Zerubbabel's temple, was, was laid. And we also know that the 24th day of the ninth month, technically the 25th, but um, you know, with, with, a, with, a, with, with the, the, the way that the day works in, in Judaism, you could bring parody to that. Uh, that was the day that the temple was rededicated. Many Orthodox, uh, not Orthodox, many completed Jews combining this with Scripture believe that um, the 24th day of the ninth month will be the day that the millennial kingdom begins. And there is a, 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 a and, and it's because of this idea, the question is, is this prophecy or is this just history? Is it just that on the 24th day of the ninth month, the foundation of the Lord temple was laid? Is that just that temple? Or is it that this will also um, be a prophecy because then he goes on to say, is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth from this day will I bless you. And so we see this idea. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month. This would be that ninth month. This would be Kislu saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, 
saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down. And so there's others that, based upon this, believe that the temple that is rebuilt, the next temple, will, will be dedicated on that day, and that that is going to usher in the destroying of the, of the, the kingdoms of the heathen, right? Um, because of this Haggai prophecy. So it's an interesting one, and I actually received this connection from a completed Jew, a man who was doing this teaching and made this connection. I thought that's fascinating. Um, and it also goes toward that concept in John 10. Why is it that in John 10, the Bible says in John 10, 22, it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter. The Feast of the Dedication is Hanukkah. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So Jesus is on Hanukkah, walking on, the, in, on Solomon's porch in the temple. And the Bible says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Here they are in this feast that is all about national overthrow of their enemies. Jesus has claimed to be Messiah. He's walking through the temple and the Feast of the Dedication, and they're saying, look, the temple's right there. Go sit, go sit in it. If this is you, just tell us plainly. Go sit right there. That's what Messiah is supposed to do, right? It's Hanukkah. It's the, well, maybe it was even the 24th of Kislev. Go sit. Go sit in that temple. Haggai 2.18. And that's when he replies that his works bear witness and his sheep hear his voice and such. And uh, then they take up stones to stone him. Uh, but uh, very much so. Uh, elements of prophecy here. That there's a lot of very unique things um, as it relates to history. I forget which day it is. Is it a day? Um, it's a very important day for the Jews where... Uh, um, there's several devastating things that happened in history since September, I think, or something of September. And it's right around their feast, and several of the most tragic days in their history all land on that exact day. Um, and it's a, it's a very important day in Judaism from that perspective. But um, we see these things, and, and we see this kind of repetition of history, and there's, there's no uh, um, reason to believe that that day, the 24th day of Kislu, the day that the foundation of the first temple was laid, the day that it was rededicated effectively in the days of the Maccabees, and there may, and many do believe, that there is still some sort of future anticipation for that day. Yeah, because of Haggai 2.18. Okay, um, next week when we come together, we will be leaving Daniel 11 and we'll be digging directly into history and we'll be uh, showing how from this point Syria has been driven out of Israel, uh, how we get to the system that the New Testament shows us with Rome, with Pharisees, with Sadducees and the like. Um, but I hope that throughout this, you got to see something very particular and special. Number one, that the intertestamental period is spoken to in the Bible. Um, and that is spoken to very clearly, very distinctly, and very accurately in the Bible. Um, that God, all of this was anticipated, and it's all meant to point us to that man Antiochus Epiphanes, who is the forerunner of Antichrist. And as we look for the spirit of that Antichrist to return in its fullness, um, we might look toward the elements surrounding Antiochus and the nature of Israel at the time and that falling away. As a matter of fact, um, in 1 Timothy 3, when it says that, that or not, not 1 Timothy 3, in Thessalonians, where it says that, that the Antichrist will not be revealed except there first be a falling away, that word falling away is a word to mean apostasy. And it's the same word that the Maccabees used to speak of those that followed Antiochus. And so many believe, uh, based on that, and I think it's a very, very solid foundation, that that falling away doesn't necessarily have to do particularly with the church proper, but rather that we are going to see a time where there is going to be, a, uh, like in the day of Antiochus, a falling away of Judaistic thought. So they'll 
uh, 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 and there will be a group of Jews. Now, nat naturally, they'll have their temple and whatnot, so there will be fervor there. But there will also be a group, a, a falling away of a group of, of, of Israel toward Antichrist, toward his philosophy, toward this one world ecumenicism type idea. And um, that there will be this great falling away as it relates to Israel. And, and there's a real possibility that that could be the case. Um, and we might even see how that, that could be set up within the idea of Judaism as it exists today with the Orthodox and then the non-practicing. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.